Hey, Rental Retires, it's Adam Schrader here with another episode. You're flying solo today, except for our guest today is Jaron Sustar. He is the Finance Cowboy. He is the founder of Finance Cowboy and host of the Finance Cowboy Show. Jaron, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me, man. I'm excited to hang out. Absolutely. So we always start with the same question for people, and that is, what was your first real estate deal? It was a rental property, long-term rental in Greenville, South Carolina. I bought it in 2018, and I just did the traditional route. It was 20% down, rehabbed it with my own money, and I was nervous as crap. I actually had a buddy help me get into the game, my best friend. He had been doing it for years and had a lot of success. He finally talks me into it. I'm scared. I'm trying to back out of the deal. He doesn't let me. I followed through with it, and I think I purchased it for like 65 or 70 grand and uh, rehabbed a little bit, got it rented out for, I don't know, 950 or 1000 bucks a month. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden, it's like my chest was bowed out. I thought I was something cool. I had all this <laughs> confidence, and I was ready to move on to the next one. So it was a quite quite an exhilarating deal, that's for sure. And so why, um, now you're a cowboy, wearing a, not a South Carolina uh, sweater right now. <laughs> why, uh, what, were you living in Greenville at the time, or did you go remote for your first one, or...? So I had moved, I live in Anderson, so I had been, uh, I, I, it's 25 minutes away. So my buddy who got me in, that was kind of their market, that in Winston-Salem at the time in North Carolina. And a lot, what they would do, they weren't necessarily wholesalers. It was a form of wholesale and they would go bird dog deals and then they would just represent their buyers. And so they would get commissions as a brokerage. And then they started keeping a lot of deals themselves and doing a bunch of partnerships. And this was just one of them where he wanted me to get in and, um, you know, I was like, hey, let's do it. So <laughs> let's do it. You, go. you said yeehaw, giddy up, right? That's it. <laughs> so that progressed into, did you wait long for your next deal or was it just, let's just keep rolling. I got this one under and let's just keep going. Yeah. Once I got that first one, man, it was, uh, it was off to the races. I got, I became a deal junkie. So I just was constantly looking for deals. And so I bought that one and I don't know when, when it was June, July, maybe. And I bought another one in around September. Did the same thing with it, 20% down, rehab my own money. And then I kind of ran into a wall a little bit because I was like, oh, crap, I don't have that much more capital. <laughs> like, I can't I can't really scale anymore. I'm stuck. And so that's when I started deploying alternative strategies. Obviously, one of them, which now is coined the Burr strategy, at the time, I had no idea. I just realized that I could get a private lender, somebody in my network, to give me capital to buy a property and, and rehab it. And then it was going to be worth way more on the back end. So as long as I knew my ARVs and then what the bank was going to allow me to refi and then what my rents were going to be, I could get into a lot of these deals without having to sync up any of my capital or if any, very little compared to 20% or having to rehab them by myself. And so we bought two properties in 2018 that first year. And then we bought 19 in 2019 between what's now known as the Burr strategy and doing partnerships and seller finance deals. And we were off to the races, man. It was, it was an exhilarating year. And so talk to a little bit about building your your network there, not just properties, but you know, you mentioned the the private lender. Not everybody has just a, a buddy who's doing private lending. And you know, they're they haven't built up their network. They might just be one person, maybe they've seen a property in their hometown that they've bought and you know, maybe done a little bit of rehab on, maybe they've, you know, driven past a bunch of thousand places and thought about deals, but they don't have that that network. What did you how did you go about building your your network. Yeah, none of us do when we first start. Um, you know, I mean, none of us have this network built out. And so it takes, it takes time and it takes work. I think one of the things that I did now, I do it on a larger scale with the Finance Cowboy brand, but long before Finance Cowboy ever existed, was I just let people know that I did real estate. So I would post my deals just on my personal Facebook and real estate groups, real estate meetup groups. I would show before and afters what I'm purchasing these properties at, what the rents are, what the ARVs are. It will really be in transparent and putting yourself out there and building a personal brand, whether you ever take it to a larger level or just a local personal brand um, is going to be huge. And doing good deals, <laughs> like, it, it, money is plentiful, uh, but as long as you're doing good deals, nobody wants to lend to bad deals. And so showing that you can find good deals and then making those connections. So breaking into the real estate investor community in whatever market that you're buying in. And so you got to go to the meetups. You got to have lunch with other investors. You got to meet with property managers, contractors, and just really start immersing yourself into that 
realm, building those relationships. And then what you realize is stuff starts to unfold over time. Like you build the relationships on the front end. And then all of a sudden, as time goes on, you go from I'm having trouble finding a deal to which deal am I going to choose because I have so many people generating me leads? Who am I going to use as my lender on this deal? Or I, I'm having trouble getting a lender on this deal to who am I going to choose to lend to me on this deal because I have them lined up? And, you know, more to your specific question of private lenders, I think the best place to start is your personal network. So friends, families, coworkers, acquaintances, start there. And you're probably going to get a no from all of those on the surface level, but then dive down each of their networks. Yo, mom and dad, who do you know? What's what's his name? You know, John, who we used to hang out with when I was younger in the real estate, you know, just and just chase those networks down and start building those relationships. And, um, you know, I don't know how else to say it other than it will organically happen over time. Yeah. Now you started doing all of this with a full-time job. Did you just have no life? Outside of this, because I mean, what you're talking about going to meetings, going to lunches, doing all this stuff, that's not an insignificant amount of time from the sound of it. So how did you fit it all into, you know, a life with the with a full time job? Yeah, I think you had to be very intentional with what you're going to do with your days. Like if you don't control, it's like budgeting. Like if you don't control where your money is going, it's going to control you. If you don't control where your time is going, then your days are going to be just chaos and you're not going to get much done. And so what's really worked for me is batching. Like I obviously had a job. I have four kids, uh, married. And so we got sports and all this stuff's been going on. And so whenever I hear people say, I just don't have time, I'm busy. I'm like, oh, you're just not, you're either being lazy or number two, you're just not focused and disciplined yet. Because if, truly, if I can do it, I believe that anybody else can, because we are as busy as anybody else can be. And so it's just setting up your days and your weeks to be able to set aside time. Like for me, it was always, you know, Fridays or Friday afternoons and then Saturday mornings, I would focus on real estate. Now, that didn't come at the expense of neglecting family. I would include them. So me my wife and my kids, we go look at properties. We check in on rehab. And so I think, you know, having your spouse, if you have a family and your kids on board, letting them be a part of that journey and then setting aside just a certain time. Like if I, you work a full-time job, great, but you got to know that from here to here is when I work on real estate. And sometimes that's going to cause you to have to get up earlier. Maybe you got to get up at five o'clock in the morning. You don't want to, maybe you got to stay up after the kids go to bed, but then you have to ask yourself, how bad do you want it? Because there's a reason only about 7% of people in the United States own rental properties or own a second home is because it's not easy. And so 93% of people say, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and so there's going to be a little, little headache that comes with it, but you got to work around it. I love that you mentioned taking your, your wife and your kids with you to look at properties. How have you included um, your kids and how has that evolved? I mean, you've been doing this for, you know, five, six years at this point in time. Kids have obviously gotten older and be be more able to understand um, what you're doing. How, how have you been going about educating your children in a way that the public school system is not going to do? Let's be completely honest. I don't remember any class I ever took in public school that discussed real estate in any way shape or form I mean economics in general you get what one semester in high school yep <laughs> um, by by somebody who really isn't an economist or anything like that they just happen to know the the content from the, the syllabus so how have you included your kids and how has that changed over the time since you've been in real estate yeah so my kids are still younger they're seven five three and one so when we first started our oldest was very young well now the five and seven year old they have a grasp and understanding of what we're doing and so for us, taking them to the properties, showing them that we go into these areas, we take homes that nobody else can buy. The average person can't buy them because they can't get a loan for them. We then make them pretty, and then we either all offer affordable quality housing to people who can't buy yet, or we turn around and we sell it on the general market, make a profit, allow somebody to buy a starter home or their second home or maybe a downsized home, and then we move on to the next. And so we explain to them, Look, this is done for two reasons. We get to help a lot of people and make our community a better place. But then we also do well financially because you have to take your income and deploy it somewhere into an asset if you plan on building wealth. That's just the the rules of the game. You can't hold on to it. And so we've been able to take those principles with them when they do their chores around their house, the tasks, they get things done. I mean, they literally come to me now immediately and say, hey, dad, I got you know $10 for doing this. Will you invest it for me? And so we've got this game going now to where they bring one of their bags of money and coins sitting right over there where they say, dad, can you invest this for me? And I'll hold it for two weeks. And if they give me 20 bucks, you know, I'll give them back 30 or something. And just really, really being able to pound in those disciplines of like, 
this is what you have to do if you want to create the life that you want for yourself. And you do right. You don't get taught that anywhere else. I grew up, my dad's a pastor. His church is a mile down the road. So I grew up in a great home, Christian home, a uh, loving family. But I mean, for most pastors, money's just not a <laughs> like a thing we have. And so that was us. Like, So we weren't talking about investments. We didn't have investments. We were definitely weren't talking about real estate. And that's okay. I'm not upset at my parents. It's just, that's the, the reality for most people. And so to have the opportunity to not only create the life I want financially through real estate, but then also be able to put myself in a position to be able to teach my kids at such an early age that that most will never learn. And if they do, it has to be self-taught in their 20s and 30s. Man, I look at what they're going to do in life and it just blows my mind. And dad, here's $10. I want two points and 12% on yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be coming one day. That's that's like the the line we gotta flirt. It's like, no, I'm still dad and you're still son. So let's <laughs> slow our roll a little bit. So speaking of, you know, your your background there with your parents not being real estate investors, I'm assuming most of your friends in twenty eighteen were not real estate investors. Um how what kind of pushback or questions did you get from them in regards to your investing and how did you get over the, you know, I don't want to say ignoring, but pretty much ignoring because none of my family, none of my friends understand what the heck I'm doing um, with real estate investing. And with them, a lot of times I just have to be like, look, it's what I do. Deal with it. You, you know, I have other people in my life who will talk real estate with. With you, I'm going to talk about, you know, other stuff. 100%. I think the majority of us are like that because so few people get into it. And, you know, people want to say it's risky or people say the stock market isn't risky. The The, the majority of uh, America's blue collar, middle class, and they are that way for a reason. They spend money that they don't have on things they don't need and they never invest. And so then they feel this type of guilt or jealousy towards those who try, who decide to be different. And so then they're going to try to drag you down out of their insecurities. And it's just what they do. And so I've come to a place now to where it's like, I could care less what you guys say because I know what it's done for my life. Um, and, and I'm in a pretty good spot. And, and now I have the brand. And so people are I'm very visible and I live in a small town. So it went from, bro, what are you doing? Why are you doing all this? To now it's always, how do you do that, bro? How, I want to get into that. I want to do that, which is great. That's why I created the brand. You know, but at the beginning, you don't have that. You're going to get a lot of, why, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And I think you have to just understand that you're different than most everybody else. And you got to surround you. That doesn't mean you have to neglect them. There's people on social media that I see a lot. It's like, if your family or friends aren't aligned with your vision, then you need to drop them. I don't think that's true. Like you can still love those people. You can still have a relationship with them. Just not in this particular sense. Don't take advice from broke people is, is simply <laughs> that. And if, if you take financial advice from people who are already where you want to be and then leave the other people to the side, then they can just watch and see how, how it changes your life. And eventually they'll be asking you how they can do it. So we just didn't care, man. We were different from the beginning. We, we spent uh, from 2013 to 2018 paying off debt. So everybody sees my story now, real estate. And they're like, oh, man, it must be nice. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't nice when we graduated college and I had $65,000 in student loan, $25,000 truck, $2,500 engagement ring, and over $10,000 in student loans. So from 13 to 18, bro, we were different than everybody else in the sense that we just were paying off debt while most people never get out of it. And so we had already kind of gone through that of like, bro, you're kind of weird. Why do y'all do that? And now <laughs> it was just this is going to be the fun part. This is going to actually change our lives. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm assuming at some point along your investing journey, um, a deal didn't work out like you uh, had planned. Like the numbers on the paper didn't quite uh, pencil out. Not that it's ever happened to anyone and every single person who's ever invested. But can you talk a little bit about your first deal that didn't go right and how you both pushed through it and then adapted to make sure that something like that wouldn't happen Again, I mean, obviously there there will be other bad deals, but that specific scenario wouldn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of them that I've had throughout my career. Um, one of the first flips I ever did, I still to this day have never seen it in person. It was in Port St. Lucie, Florida, and um, it was just a disaster. You know, we were set to make, you know, call it 25, 30 grand uh, gross profit before taxes. And I think when it was all said and done, it was somewhere between five to $8,000. And I was in with a partner on it. So they were the capital partner. I was the managing partner and I get done and I have whatever it was, five to $8,000 check. And we're supposed to split that in two. And I was like, uh, just take it all. <laughs> so I like did, went through this months and months of a flip and it actually made no money. I didn't have to put money in the deal, but it was a lot of stress and headache. And what happened was it, just terrible communication. So me and the person who were managing the project, I was newer. I haven't been doing this long. I didn't set expectations. 
I didn't get itemized quotes. We did not communicate on when the pay schedule was going to be, how we were going to pay, what the permit situation was going to look like, buffers and rehabs. I mean, there was just so much that went wrong. I didn't understand analyzing completely and how to make sure I was running the right numbers and what it was going to cost me monthly, the longer it stayed out. And so, you know, we get to the end of it and, um, and didn't really make any money. And so I think the biggest thing I learned from there is uh, communication is key and expectations are key. And you got to be able to have those, especially with your team contractors being a big part of that to understand uh, this is what I want done. This is when I need it done. Can you do it? Give me itemized quote and agree that you're going to get it done by here. And there's a lot more that goes into that. But it was a huge learning experience for, you know, managing rehab, really. Yeah, absolutely. And how has your investing philosophy in changed over the, the years, if it has at all, uh, in regards to maybe properties that you buy or properties that you don't buy necessarily? Um, can you talk a little bit about how, especially as we went through the the pandemic, kind of how has your investing philosophy changed? Man, I've, I've pretty much been the same the entire time. And, um, you know, once I find something that works, why change it? And so for me, not to say that I haven't invested in other types of assets, because I have, but I focus, my primary focus is single family homes in B to C class neighborhoods that are distressed, that I can buy undervalued, make them pretty, and then either one, burr them and keep them in my portfolio, or two, flip them if they, number one, don't make sense as a burr, or if I'm needing or wanting capital at that time for whatever reason. And we pretty much go into every deal looking for that. BDC class neighborhood, distressed property, get it undervalued, try to burr it. If that's not going to make sense, flip it and move on to the next one. And so, yeah, I've owned a mini mobile home park. I invest in syndications and funds and own skyscrapers, pieces of skyscrapers and commercial and warehouses and all uh, just kind of passively. But when I, my personal portfolio and what we're doing, we pretty much stay true to the residential space uh, all these years. I don't see us deviating anytime soon. So how have you avoided the shiny, uh, the shiny object syndrome? Because I mean, that's, especially with real estate, you mentioned all those other things. I mean, it's easy to, to straight up go down that rabbit hole, not just, not just kind of passively invest in it, but it's easy to be like, oh, well, you know, that guy over there is making a ton of money doing that. Let me let me set this off to the side a little bit and start pursuing that. So how have you stayed that laser focused on the residential side? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the grass usually isn't greener. So not to say that you can't make money in all of them. You definitely can. You definitely can. But then you have to build out different infrastructures. You know, if you're going to move from residential to commercial or multifamily, then there's more team members, more that goes into it, different lender partners potentially. And so I think there's a place for it. And if I come across a great multifamily deal and the numbers make sense, I'm not going to just sit there and say no to it if it's just a killer deal. But my focus is just on what's been working for me. Like there, it, I would be dumb because I've, you know, I've been doing this six years. And when we started, we had probably a negative 10,000 net worth or right at zero bucks, whatever you want to call it. And today it's over 2 million based on that strategy that we've done just acquiring single family homes. And so I've come from a middle-class family, wasn't expected to do this, never thought I would be doing it personally. And I'm like, okay, I have something that works. And I'm not saying you want to be stagnant and never evolve, but like, I'm still growing. We haven't, we haven't become stagnant yet. And so I'm just like, that would be, it'd be kind of dumb for me to, to lose focus on something that's really changed my life. Talk a little bit about the origins of finance cowboy. When did you, when did you come up with that? How did you come up with that? And kind of what is a finance cowboy? So it actually started uh, in 2021. I started under the name before Finance Cowboy existed, the Million by 30 coach, because we had just become millionaires before 30. And then I was like, ah, that's a little too niche. And so I was trying to think of a different name that's a little more broad and could reach more people. And I was putting on boots one night to go on a date with my wife. And I was like, oh, Finance Cowboy. And so at the time, I would talk a lot about personal finance along with real estate. So now I talk a lot more about real estate. So I think the name can be a little misleading. But I, uh, I had a friend who... Um, who's very high up in their job. Like I'm more of a blue collar, you know, whatever, rough around the edges guy. This friend is white collar, high up at, you know, a nice big hospital that everybody's heard of, a big executive. And so I've been having a lot of success in real estate. So I've been telling this dude, I'm like, hey man, you need to get into real estate. You're making good money. Like, look what it's done for me. And he'd always just kind of blow me off. I don't know if Jaren knows what he's doing, but you know, that type of ordeal. And so in June of 2021, 
or May, whatever it was, this guy started sending me Instagram posts. This was before I had my brand of this like 25 year old who had a little brand, like 30,000 followers on social media, who was talking about how investing in index funds are what you should do. And so now because this kid who had just a minimal net worth had authority in the social media space, now this friend of mine started buying index funds because of him. And not only did he start buying index funds, he's now texting me, telling me this is what I need to be doing. And I'm like, bro, here's my net worth. Here's this kid's net worth. I'm not buying. I'm not doing this. I'm going and buying real estate. Look what it's done for me. And so it kind of pissed me off. And I was like, well, okay, this clown, and I know the guy on social media now who he sent it to, and he's not a clown. He's a great guy. But at the time, I'm like, if this clown can convince my highly educated friend to start doing this particular type of investment, I need to get on and start telling my story. And, uh, you know, it kind of evolved from there and we hit a couple videos and posts that went viral and, um, we're still very, very small, relatively speaking, but we've had the opportunity to reach millions with our content and we coach a ton of people and do a bunch of free stuff. And it's, uh, it's been a blast. It's been an absolute blast. On your website, you have a 19 point checklist for analyzing rental properties. I'm not going to ask you to go through all 19 because that, uh, would be a bit excessive, but tell a little bit about kind of what some of your favorite ones or most important ones are on there and kind of how you came about to deciding that these were metrics worth, um, worth using. Cause I mean, there's a whole lot of data points you could use for something. So how did you, you know, shrink it down to 19? You're actually just hurting me asking me this question right now, because I am doing a free training on the 28th on this. And so before this all morning, I have been putting together my PowerPoint for this training and writing all this stuff down. And I was sick of it. I was so glad the show was coming up. <laughs> and now you're asking me about it again. And I'm like, oh, come on. I got to I got to go finish this when we get done. No, I'm joking. But, you know, I think analyzing deals is something a lot of people struggle with. I know it took me a number of deals before I actually felt confident that I was running correctly. I was always leaving something out. It could have been I was leaving vacancies out, I was leaving taxes out, or I was leaving insurance, and you think that's a minor thing, but it's, it's not. You actually skew your numbers uh, dramatically, and then you could get yourself into a deal thinking your cash flow is going to be this, your ROI is going to be this, and it's not. And so knowing how to analyze is very, very, very important. And so this checklist is just a thing that I kind of made for myself when I was starting investing so that I knew, okay, I need to do this, I need to look for this, I need to look for that. And so it's things like your mortgage, so your principal interest, your taxes, your insurance. If you got holding costs, you need to account for maintenance. You need to account for capital expenditures, vacancy, property management, utilities, HOA, any services like trash and landscape you might have. And all of those won't be used on every deal. If you're buying long-term rentals like I do, we don't generally have HOAs. We don't generally have to cover utilities and blah, blah, blah. But it just walks you through all those metrics you need to look for and where you can find them at. And then it also talks about the data points that we're trying to accomplish as far as on the back end. So cash flow, how do we figure out what that cash flow number is, or the cash on cash return number is, or the NOI, debt coverage ratio, all that good stuff. And it just equips you with being able to, to be able to plug numbers into a calculator or whatever you use for deal analysis and make sure that you're not leaving thing, anything on the table and then understanding the results it's given. What are your thoughts on the next kind of year in real estate. I know there's a lot of people thinking interest rates are going to come down. There's a lot of people who are still waiting for some form of a crash to happen in real estate. Some people are saying there's going to be a boom whenever interest rates come down. What are you expecting to see in the next, you know, roughly 12 months? I think, it, you know, I don't see a crash happening personally. I think, you know, when you talk to old timers talking about the crash specifically, who've been doing this a long time, and you ask them about 07, 08, 09, because that's what we all live through. And that's what everybody goes to. They're waiting on that to happen again. If you talk to any old head who's been doing this a long time, they're like, bro, we've never experienced anything like that in our life. That's the only time in our 80 years of being on earth where we've ever experienced that. And so I was like, okay, let's go look at data. And so I pulled this graph and I wish I had the URL. I'd share it with you. It was like from 1940 until today. And it, out of all those years, there have been seven years, only seven, where real estate did not go up in value in the United States overall. All right. And so five of those years, it stayed at zero. It just was flatline. And then two years, which was 08 and 09, I believe it was, it actually went down in value. So I'm a big data-driven guy because we're emotional beings and so many people don't get into some form of investing because of fear. And I'm like, okay, how can we remove this fear from our brain? 
replace it with logic, and then go do what we need to do to make our future self proud. And when I looked at that data, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, we had a couple down years, those two years, and the, and the real estate crashed, but that's not common. And so if you live life waiting on the next crash, waiting on the next crash, waiting on the next crash, you may be 70 years old and still never bought real estate. Now you're about to die. And so I kind of take life from a YOLO perspective in a very uh, controlled manner, not in a reckless manner. It's like, <laughs> well, you got one life to live. And if you want to set yourself up for success, you've got to be able to take some risk. And so I say I like to say, I don't think a crash is coming. Uh, the supply is so short. We, we have such a huge supply shortage. Um, and then, you know, rates are, are eventually going to come down. I, you know, they were talking about doing it three times this year. Now it looks like that may slow. They were talking about doing it three times, I think 24, 25 basis points each. So that may slow down. So you, the, the, the rate at which homes are selling may not be as fast. But one thing I've noticed just in the investor market in the last two months compared to the previous 10 months, I would say, is there's a lot more competition. I don't know if you've seen it in your market, but there for a while, it's kind of a dull dead period. And then now it's like, bro, I'm, I'm having to compete against multiple offers on homes again. And so like the market's moving, people are getting more used to rates. So yes, it's like they're, you know, if they're stuck in a 3% mortgage environment and they don't want to move, well, yeah, then they're not going to move, but we're humans. Eventually we're going to get used to seeing seven, we're going to get used to seeing six, five and a half. And people who've been living in a house because they had a 3% interest, but they don't love the house, they're not going to be able to stand it anymore. It's called middle middle class. And I hate to keep bashing on the middle class, but all my friends are like this. It's like eventually it's like you can conjure yourself up into saying, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do it. I don't care the financial implications. <laughs> and so that's what's going to happen. And then when you look at it, it's like, bro, rates aren't even that high compared to where we've been you know, in the past. It's like, um, it. For me, it's does the deal make sense right now? Can I can I buy this deal still cash flow? Can I buy this deal still make a profit no matter what rates are, prices, whatever the case may be? And so, um, now I don't, you know, I, I think it stays kind of as it is. To be honest with you, like what it is right now through twenty twenty four, and then as rates drop, I think the consumer market will definitely pick up more. You you touched a little bit about kind of the the YOLO and the people who are concerned. What do you say to the people who have been sitting on the sidelines and are thinking about getting into investing, but just haven't taken that step to acquire their first rental property. Um, kind of, how do you, how do you help them with their mental anxiety that they are feeling? You have to brainwash yourself to the point where you believe not investing in real estate is riskier for, for your future than investing in real estate. Every day that you don't buy property, you have to look back or look forward to yourself and 10, 20, 30 years and understand that you're robbing from that person. And um, if you can get that mindset and understand that I don't want to rob from my future self anymore, I want to set them up for success. And I'm okay with a little bit of risk because anything worth having, there's going to be risk, there's going to be headache with it. Uh, but knowing that the majority of people who've dabbled in this asset have become ridiculously wealthy since the beginning of time. We're not dealing with a cryptocurrency or a Bitcoin or whatever that's speculative, quote unquote, that hasn't been around. It's only been around since 09. We're talking about people who have bought land and bought property from the beginning of time have been the folks who have been wealthy. And I think if you can wrap your mind around that and, um, you know, learn to trust numbers, then you can move forward. And pretty much, quite frankly, you have to move forward if you want to create the dream life. Fantastic. Well, Jared, thanks so much for joining us. The website is financecowboy.com. Tell people about kind of what they're going to see when they go there and who, you know, who's going to benefit the most from joining your community. Yeah. So we got a bunch of free resources there. Take advantage of them. I got a ton of videos on YouTube. I have a podcast myself. Feel free to check them out. And then, you know, we obviously coach people as well. We have a mentorship and it's really for people who are brand new to real estate where they have a couple properties and they're having trouble scaling. And so I pretty much just walked them through everything that I did to be able to get to where we are today. So uh, whether you're looking for free stuff or want more of a handheld, we got you covered and I uh, appreciate you following us and checking us out. All right. Well, fantastic. Again, that website is financecowboy.com. If you want to check out the properties we have, you can head over to renttoretirement.com. Schedule a time to talk with us, see our inventory there. And as always, if you have any questions that you want answered in future episodes, please email them to podcasts at renttoretirement.com. That's podcasts at renttoretirement.com. Really appreciate the time you spent educating yourselves today. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos like this one or this one here.